welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I'm the actor. My name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. <laughs> Here we go, Josh. You're allowed to do whatever you want to do. It's your time. It's your movie. It's your it's your thing. Hey, so. well, it's not. You know, it can be everyone's movie. That's what the great part yeah, about the Mission Impossible it, franchise is that it's, it's your made, thing, though. But it's made for like the maximal amount of enjoyment for the most amount of people. So, I mean, I, I, I had a lot of fun. I saw it twice. I dig it. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the first thing I wanted to say to you is this is the first one in a long time that I can't wait to see again. Yeah. And that's and I don't know if you remember, we've talked about quite a few over the years, Mission Impossible, and they go in one ear and write out the other for me. And that's mm-hmm. not a criticism of the films. It's just the way my brain, I think, takes things in. This one does a much better job of huh. sticking it. And, and, and good. I think it has to do with it being one of two, which is a question I have. Um, that face right there. I have a to problem a, with it too. Okay. It, it's, uh, that's yeah. not, I have a problem. I didn't say problem. Well, I have I a said, problem with it. Period. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I think that the very first thing I want to say is that I had a lot of fun. It's a popcorn movie. I enjoy that kind of stuff. It's great to just go to the theater and not think, but also have other parts of your being engaged. It's, it, it, it engages you in a different way than like drive my car or something like that. Mm-hmm. Not, in necessarily a better way or a worse way or any of the above, not to compare, you know, Academy Award nominated film like Drive My Car to this, but they're, they all have their own groove that you can dance to, these type of movies. And like I said, I had a lot of fun. And I think the reason why this one sticks is because they did a good job, and it might be a criticism because I sent you some notes about whether or not the repeating of the narrative of this film is over. And, uh, they show that cross a thousand times. But in a way, that's a good thing because with everything exploding around that narrative, you sometimes, or at least I do, get lost in translation of what's going on in the film and what my main goal is. They never let you lose focus of those two pieces need to come together because this is going to happen and we need to stop it from happening, which is essentially every Mission Impossible film. But for whatever reason, the way they simplified it, maybe because it's a part one of two, it's stuck for me. So I thought it was fun. Well, me too. And I think that this movie is where Mission Impossible goes full like pinky in the brain mode where it's like (laughs) we're going to take over the world. Like this is the most kind of like extreme James Bond villain plot that uh, that I've seen out of them. And I think that that, I mean, that's one one big issue I had was that uh, was that this it's such a huge plot point that they're trying to make it such a huge you know ask that they're trying to do like you know they're you know the ai is trying to take over the world essentially and trying to to get rid of humans or whatever and so we we're not really asked as an audience to deal with that in this movie we're just asked as the audience to get the key like they need to get the key that's all they need to do and they're very upfront about it like this is you know kind of like we talked about with uh with indiana jones recently like they're they've they're wearing their heart on the sleeve on their sleeve this is a MacGuffin, you know, first and foremost. There, It doesn't really mean anything. They've already done it in movies like Mission Impossible 3 where the rabbit's foot never really is, it's never really indicated exactly what the rabbit's foot is. They kind of intimate as to what it could be, you know, but but it's nothing that is, you know, laid out there. I mean, I think that, that with this movie, they're kind of laying out, you know, we're in the struggle for humanity because of this rogue AI that's that's gone crazy. But uh, but ultimately, in this movie, the only thing that they're worried about is getting the two halves of this key and getting them, keeping them away from the entity. So, like, that's all you need to know. And as far as uh, an action movie is concerned, that's really all you you should need to know because really, the thing that everybody's coming for is all all the cool stunts, all of the amazing uh, you know cinematography, and the the great score, the just kind of like pounding score, and the the fact that we all know everybody going in i mean even if you're just a you know a passerby you know that tom cruise does all of his own stunts like so that right there is is something that where we're kind of hearkening back to a uh, buster keaton charlie chaplin this guy's doing it you know and he's not a professional stuntman which i mean there were no really professional stuntmen back in the day so you know it if if buster keaton wanted to see somebody you know on the front of a train trying to get a 
a, a, a board off of the out of the way before he crashes, he's gonna have to do it because nobody else is there to do it. Whereas nowadays we've got this this guy who I, I think ultimately the one of the big one of the big reasons why uh, Tom Cruise has gotten to this point is that the stunts that he wants to do. I don't know if they would be able to get like insurance for a lot of the stunts that they do if a stuntman did them. But mm. since he's bankrolling, since it's his production company and he's essentially bankrolling a good chunk of the movie, then he's able to insure himself and say like, if I die, you get X number of, you know, whoever it is, uh, Paramount gets X number of millions of dollars because the movie can't be made, whatever. But that's really the only way he's able to do a lot of these stunts and potentially the only way that anybody would be able to do these stunts and have them in a movie. So, I mean, last respect for him. I, I think that, you know, the, the, the stunt that everybody talks about is the, the motorcycle jump base jumping stunt. But I think there's a lot of other really cool stunts in this movie that kind of like, since the motorcycle jump is, is far enough into the movie, by the time we get to that point, I was like, I'm pretty satisfied with, with stunts at this point. And so like, that's just the icing on the cake. So I was, I was I surprised at that actually. I do want to, um, not contradict what you said, but, um, I, I do semi disagree with the thing. Well, not disagree, but I, I, I take the other side to the fact that the narrative is so simple that we come to see this film for the explosions and the stunts and everything like that. But you do have to have a certain at stake level because yes, you can be climbing through a train, <laughs> in the most horrific kind of way Poseidon adventure happening thing going on and completely destroying my equilibrium in the meantime in in the best kind of way scared the hell out of me that whole train sequence and mm. it keeps going yep. and going and going and it's going relentless. it Ugh. is relentless which what is what makes it brilliant but you do have to have a certain at stake in order to be invested in whether or not they survive those train wrecks or not. So in a way, they simplified it, like I was saying. And I think that, yes, I mean, we're not saving the world, although technically they are saving the world. But it's not anything that you can't understand on a, a very simple level. And But at the same time, it being what it is makes those stunts even more incredible, in my opinion. So I would say that, yes, it's a simplification of a narrative, but it's still, I mean, it's world changing and it's in our consciousness right now, which is really smart because however Cruz does it, whatever black magic he has or whatever white magic he has, he has his thumb on the pulse of what scares America or what scares the world. And not scares, but what concerns people. And now look what's happening with all the strikes and the AI and all that stuff that's going on. So in a way, it's quite brilliant uh, that that's where he has his thumb uh, print or thumb pulse or whatever. Um, but I, I do think there's just enough at stake to keep you invested in all of the other stuff that goes around. So I did, I thought that was good. Yeah, me too. I mean, I was going to say that like, well, you know, this movie was like written and, and made, you know, it started to be made back in 2020, you know, and they got shut down in, in Venice. And then I think they moved to, um, no, they got shut down in Rome, then they moved to Venice, and then they got shut down there. And so it was, it, it was one of those things. And that was like, right at the height of you know, summer 2020, when it started getting really bad. So this movie's been delayed multiple times. So they had already had some sort of a, an idea of, of certain things, but I don't even know how much of the movie was written at that point, because the way that Christopher McQuarrie and Tom Cruise have done this in the past few movies is that they will essentially come up with set pieces for the their stunts and say like, we want to go to Rome. We want to have a base jump off of a mountain. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to do an underwater scene, whatever it is that we want to have a desert scene. Then what they're going to do is figure out a way to fit that within a narrative. So that seems like a very backwards way to do a movie. But at the same time, I mean, it's, it's kind of putting a challenge in, in your way. It, it's, it's kind of, it's making their lives a lot more difficult as far as the, the writer is concerned or writers. There's two writers on the script from Corey and another guy, but um, just as long as it's able to hold together enough to, to get us to the finish line, I think, I think that we'll be, will be okay. And that's the my main issue with with the part one, part two, is that 
I I feel I just hope they can land the plane. I hope this isn't like a weird lost scenario where it's like, oh man, the ending of this thing is going to be crazy cool. And then they're kind of like, oh, well, we don't really know what the ending is going to be. So I hope there's some sort of good resolution to all of this because they didn't really need to explain a lot of things in this movie. They just needed to, like I said, focus us on the, the key and how important the key was. But uh, oof, I, I hope they they really know what they're doing <laughs> with Well, with I have a question narrative. about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in a way, that's kind of backwards, but kind of brilliant. Because if you're, because the stunts and the uh, the thrills are what people, like you said, come to see about this film, and to weave something around it as simply intricate as this is, I think it's quite brilliant. I think that's harder to do, obviously, yeah. and I think they and I think they pulled it off. So, is Dead Reckoning to the end of Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise? Uh, that's what he said, but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, okay. they brought in Jeremy well, Renner to to potentially replace him, but then that didn't happen because. Tom Cruise didn't want it to happen, I guess. I don't know. Well, the thing about it is, is if it's part one and part two, and then that's the end, then I'm okay with part one and part two. But if it's yep. part one and part two, and, and then it continues on, it's uh, it's it's it might be a little too much. It might be enough is enough, yep. and it's not doing that well financially. So I'm a little scared of what's going to happen to part two. I mean, they'll probably make it no matter what. He'll make and it. it it, it it well, I mean, it's not doing that well. So it was also uh, the most expensive Mission Impossible movie. I mean, it was two hundred ninety one million dollars. The first one was no, yeah, the movie we just saw because of wow. all the delays and all you know shutting down and all of these things. It just took so much long. It took years longer to make than they thought. I'm not necessarily talking about. I don't really get into box office draw or money or first opening weekend and all that other stuff. I don't know how that became part of our language of being human and existing in an entertainment world or going to an entertainment world. I don't know how that became part of our language. I don't really care what it makes. Yeah. But my point is, is this, if you ask people on the streets and I have quite a few, not everybody, you know, but some people have, they seen the new mission impossible their response normally has been, there's a new Mission Impossible film out there. So mm. that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the finances. I'm sure it'll recoup all of its money because it's it's that, that type of film. But people are not as invested in this film as they have been with the other ones, at least in general, until maybe Barbie goes away or Barbie get, dies down and Oppenheimer dies down or whatever that phenomenon that's happening with both those two films which i think is great mm -hmm. i think that maybe and also summertime movies take some time to build the difference between this one and all the other ones is it didn't take any time to build the other ones they already had their 300 million dollar week before the second weekend it was open so i could care less <laughs> well, but i'm yeah. gonna go see it i just wonder wh how that's going to put constraints on the next one and in a way that might be a good thing because maybe. sometimes when you have constraints you have to think in inventively so maybe they'll think and i just hope they let it go if dead reckoning 2 is as successful as i thought the first one is then it's a good period we're done part yeah. one part two dead reckoning dead franchise done I, I would hope so, but I think that just Paramount in general is not gonna not gonna leave it there. And I think that that's we haven't talked about Haley Atwell yet, but I think she was awesome in this movie. I think she she did a great job, and I think that they may be trying to set her up for some sort of spinoff or something. Like they would, I mean, like anybody might, but um, but but they the whole like seeing her from the very beginning even you know the first time we see tom cruise when he's has that conversation with the guy dropping off his little tape recorder and and all of the the dossier information um and he's like oh you made the choice you know it's, it's all about if you choose to accept it you made the choice and that's never been a thing before like the history of ethan hunt hasn't been a thing and and it's just ethan you know kind of in in some ways like with james bond before we got to uh, Casino Royale in 20, well, 2006, uh, Ethan Hunt uh, all, has always existed and will always exist type of a thing. You know, it's like the, you know, James Bond always existed and has always existed. So, and will always exist. It's same thing where, but now we're getting this like 
flashback thing where we see some woman gets killed by a guy who ends up being a representative of the entity later on and you know it, it marks a, a, a point in Ethan Hunt's life where he has to make a choice so I that's kind of the backstory that they're trying to uh, equate Ethan Hunt's journey to potentially what Haley Atwell's character's journey Grace her journey uh, would be and so I think that they're trying to kind of like set up a parallel character that Ethan Hunt rides off into the sunset and Grace has her whole career as an IMF agent. And it won't be called Mission Impossible. It might be called IMF. It might be called the, the, I don't know what else. But but that's that's what I foresee. I just don't foresee them removing the, the capability to, to build on previous IP. That's just not... Yeah. That's not what that these guys. I do. don't disagree with you. I just didn't get that from the film. I thought oh, they were okay. just finally giving Ethan Hunt a backstory, and they were finally giving you how this all comes about. And it, that's a common narrative in these characters' stories. You know, you 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 have a choice at at uh, this moment to either go this way or that way. And actually, there really isn't a choice because it's either that or go to jail or be killed or whatever the. Uh, the circumstances may be and so they're kind of doing that to her too they're kind of saying hey because she's you know the the triple spy quadruple spy she's good she's bad she's this she's that she's in for it for herself does she really understand what's going on i think there's more to her character than we have seen because why is she so defiant to everything that he says? And I mean, it might just be because she wants to profit from this, but she knows mm -hmm. closer to the end of the film exactly what the consequences are about this key. And yet she double crosses them, triple crosses them, quadruple qua crosses them again and again and again to the point where we're like, wait, did you not hear what the stakes of this game are? What? Why are you doing what you're doing? So I'm wondering if she's working for somebody else and she's going to be some kind of double agent. I'm not saying she is. Hmm. But to me, it just gave me a backstory to Ethan Hunt, which I'm not exactly sure we needed. I'm not sure we needed that backstory. I'm not sure we needed. I mean, it's no it's no different than everything else that's happened to him a million times in these movies. So, I mean, it's kind of like history repeats itself. He's always saying saving somebody who just dies at the last moment. He's, you know, it it it. it, uh, it is a catalyst for the rest of the motivation for the rest of the films. So it's nothing new. So that's uninteresting for me. And I think that if they had left it out and just left it up to the audience to understand that, that oh, that must have happened to Ethan Hunt too also, then we could fill in the blanks. And that makes it more interesting to actually see it verbatim. I'm not so sure was the the most interesting choice. For yeah, me. there there was... Uh, uh they bandied about potentially de-aging Tom Cruise for that scene and seeing Tom Cruise. I, I like the way that they shot it where you only see him in silhouette and, and you do see that they de-aged, uh, Esaias Morales, the, the guy who plays Gabriel. Um, but, uh, they didn't de-age Tom Cruise. I think I've heard multiple reasons why that might not have happened. Like Tom Cruise doesn't ever want to be de-aged in a movie or something, but <laughs> I mean that that's up to him. We're we're back to that. Like what you know? What do you own? Do you own your likeness? Do you not own your likeness? Whatever. Oh, so, side note. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad this is part of a, a conversation. Part of the conversation today. Uh, you had asked me last podcast how I felt about that, and yeah. I kind of gave sort of an unanswer uh, to it that I didn't really know how I felt about it. Since then, I have found out that part of the acting actor strike is that uh, these corporations, these big film corporations want to, with extras, scan your body and then be able to use it over and over again. That I think is wrong. Yeah. That I think is, if if you're going to pay for Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, whoever's likeness to be used because that's a corporation on itself and that that's a money-making business, then you should have to pay somebody if you use their likeness again and again and again and you should have to pay them reasonably or at least as much as you paid them the first time so you're an extra in a movie and you get 150 bucks a day i'm not sure how much it is uh, back when i was well, doing it's like 80 bucks a day well that there's so, about 200 dollars a day that was the kind of like amount those bandied about you 200 dollars a day to come in you get scanned and then they own your likeness now i've heard different things i've, I've heard they own your likeness for that project 
for the rest of like Ted Lasso used digital double type type things. And so that would mean that like you go, to, go in, you they pay you $200, they scan you. And then every Ted Lasso episode, you can be in the stands as a digital double. Yeah, I think double. that's wrong. That's yeah. wrong. That's wrong. That's like saying since you punch into work at McDonald's for your eight hour shift for the rest of the week, you're going to not get paid because you've already punched in for one shift. It's you're going to different shifts. So if you're being used for different things, especially not the same scene that you were used for originally, or even if you're used for that scene again in a flashback or uh, whatever, then you should be paid because it your likeness is your likeness. So you should be paid. Mm -hmm. I, when you first asked me that question, I thought you were, I re-listened to it and I thought you were asking me at the time, did I think it was okay to use a scanned image like of Harrison oh. Ford, but, and, but he would be getting paid for that. He would be getting paid or his corporation or his whatever, uh, his business organization is. Cause you know, his people who help him and stuff like that. He's all actors of his caliber have, you know, teams and they all get mm -hmm. paid based on what he gets paid. So he obviously has to divvy out a certain amount to his agent, to his publicist, to his manager, blah, 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 blah. And if they're going to use his image in the future past his life, then yes, he's probably going to get paid for that. So I think if you're going to start here and you go all the way down to just a simple person like myself who just wants to make 200 bucks for sitting in the stands of some baseball film, which I've actually done, <laughs> um, and it was 80 bucks, a bag of M&Ms and a hot dog. I'll never forget it. I, <laughs> and it was all night long. Anyway. Are you going to say the movie? No. Um, <laughs> no. No. No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I mean, there is a little bit of humble pie in my 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 fabric of my being. No, it's, a, it, it's weird. It's totally weird. Um, it's not the movie you're thinking of, though. Um, anyway, I didn't get... I got paid good for that one, but I didn't get food for that one. Anyway, well, if you um, tell the story, they will come. So I'm just gonna. Oh my god, I'm not telling the story. You're not gonna. <laughs> you're not gonna make me. It's a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> the point is that that we digressed off of what we were talking about. Yes. And if you're if you're going to use somebody's body, face, whatever, in the stands for a movie or for extra work, then they should be paid exactly the same amount as if they were there or not there period okay that's only fair that's only fair all right yeah it's so interesting because like as an actor you have multiple things you have your likeness you also have your performance but kind of like we talked about in the past episode and other episodes david fincher can take your performance and he can cut it up eight ways to sunday and when does it stop being your performance yeah, so i don't care David Finch can <laughs> but it's do whatever great. he wants. Well, you know what's really strange is that they have all of these weird things in Hollywood on this high level, scale level, and David Fincher can and button or you is what I call it now. And it's it it'll be okay and you'll get credit as the actor and you know, you could even win awards, which is great. But it's still your take and he's still manipulating your take and so forth and so on. The crazy part is is on the small level that I do it on, you can't film, photograph, or anything in those small community theaters without having to pay for all of that stuff. And if that stuff gets out, you can get sued and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. Cause many people have asked me, Hey, can you film your play and we can see it later? And I'm like, no, they can't because then they have to pay this and they have to do this and all this. There's the rules are so strict. And even if you mention the possibility of doing a play or putting a play on your docket for the, the season, I mean, it's all, you can't show the image. You can't blah, blah, blah. It's all very specific. So if it's that specific for this level, then it needs to be that specific for you know the higher ups and it is and it's complicated mm. and i get where mm. people want to just make money but fair is fair yeah all right so let's start off with this cold open um uh we'll probably the longest be doing... cold open ever <laughs> we will it's probably... a long cold open it is and i would say spoilers from now on so um but but yeah it is a long cold open um it's too long but yeah i they're trying to set stuff up. I, it'd be interesting to watch once Dead Reckoning Part Two comes out. It'd be interesting to watch it as a full five-hour-long movie and see if it pans out a little bit better. Because you're right, it takes up a good chunk of the movie, um, and they they do a lot in there. And I don't have any problems with the with you know submarine scenes, and it does harken back a little bit to like Hunt for Red October type of a feel, especially with how they get 
uh, out of speaking Russian and into speaking English. It's a it's a neat little thing, kind of like in Hunt for Red October. Uh, that is probably some sort of an homage to that. But but I, I like that. Um, but but it's trying to set something up, and it. But the the problem is we don't see any of the main players until way later. So like twenty minutes, right? Yeah, it's it's a little rough. But and then even once we do see that, it's it's a very similar beginning to. Uh, to fall out where, you know, he's in a safe house or something and gets all the information and then goes through. But we do get to hear Kittredge, uh, Henry Zerny from the first movie, uh, is back and you get to hear his voice and, and all that. So that, that was kind of cool. Um, but it kind of like, uh, you know, trudges along a little bit, uh, before, you know, at that point, but then we get into the, uh, uh, the scene where he goes to, uh, to the desert to, to find Ilsa. And so that was, uh, how did you feel about that one? Did that feel tacked on? Okay. Let's, how did you feel about Ilsa being back? Just I don't that right there. And then we'll get into what happens to Ilsa. Well, I, my immediate reaction was where is the theme song and where is the title credit? Because that's mm-hmm. half of the fun. It's like half of the fun of not half of the fun, but it's a lot of the fun of a James Bond film. You know, the theme and how it, uh, uh, how they decide to show it and um, make it the theme for the the actual film. So, if you're sitting in a movie theater wondering if the cold opening is going to be just the cold opening and the the thing that's going to make this Mission Impossible different from the outset is that they're not going to have an opening. You know, whatever the uh, yeah the what is it the it's a fuse um, the fuse i can't can't think of the word fuse uh so you're if you're waiting for it and it gets past a point where you think it's not going to happen that's disappointing because your mind is not paying attention to what you're watching is paying attention to what you think you want and as for ilsa i think she's an interesting character i think they have interesting chemistry i can't figure out we could talk about this later on i can't figure out if they should have just left it there or what would have been more interesting if they had left it where it was uh which in the back of your mind you're like like it's not a thing right well we're, we're in spoilers now i think that like it's pretty definitive having a knife in your heart that's like yeah, but you, they're wearing facial prosthetics that people believe are actual other people. So okay. you, you're, the delusion of illusion is up there. So okay. I don't know. I just thought I thought it was a weird way to just bring her back and then get rid of her immediately. I thought that that was unnecessary. It's, it's very weird. I don't yeah, understand it, that choice. Yeah. Well, because she's so popular, because she is the thing now, and she is the... Uh, she has a spirit. I shouldn't say she's the thing. She has a spirit that we're all very attracted to right now. And, um, and their chemistry is great. So I understand it because people are going to want to know, people are going to want to know what's happening. I'd like to go back to the submarine thing really quick. And Mm -hmm. this is one of the things I like the best about this film. This film, I don't think breaks any ground when it comes to stunts, but I think that the way that the stunts are played out are original and new. And we can talk about the car chase, which is great. We Mm. can talk about the train thing, which is great. What was interesting about the sub thing was that in the back of a person's mind, or at least in my mind, you're thinking about what would it be like to die like that, obviously, because people are dying like that. And they set it up that it's under the Arctic pole or where it's at. It's a polar ice ice. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, What he said. And... You're thinking to yourself, what would it be like to be underneath that? What would it be like to like be inside a submarine that implodes? And then all of a sudden, they give you exactly what it's like. And the bodies float up and hit the top. And I'm like, okay, we've seen everything else in movies over the last couple hundred years. Everything else we've seen in this submarine adventure, we've seen it. Have we seen that? We've seen drowning victims. We've seen people drown and float in water, but we have we ever seen them float and hit the ice and just stay there? No. And it was horrifying. And I was like, that's really sadistic, but really smart because it makes your fear come true. The worst case scenario of where your body's going to be after something like that. It's not, you're not, you're not even going to get rescued. You're just going to float there for an whatever and however long it's going to take for you to deteriorate because you're in frozen water. You're there for a long time. That to me 
was mind bending. And I think they do that over and over and over again in this film. There are certain stunts that you're like, oh, okay. But then they kind of twist and turn it on its side into what you're not expecting. And we can go back into this later on. But with the car chase scene, when he beep, beep for the car and the car backs up yeah. and it's the little Fiat clown car. You're Instead like not of the ex- Lamborghini or whatever it was. Or the <laughs> James Bond it. car or the Mission yeah. Impossible car. So I was like, yes, I'm in. Because now, no matter what they do, even if it's the exact same thing they've done over hundreds of years of car chases, it doesn't matter. That I've never seen. I've never seen that kind of humor. And the humor in this Mission Impossible film, although it's not a lot, it's there. And they really lean into it because that <laughs> his look on his face is hysterical. And she's like, really? And he's like, yeah, this is the one that showed up. Let's go. And yeah. what they do with that is really well done. So anyway, I don't know why I digress back to the sub, but I thought that that shot was incredible. Back to the opening, cold opening. I think that you can't really call it a cold opening because it's really 20 minutes of the film. It's it's They just put the title sequence in a different place. So is it the cold opening? Because well, cold openings are not 20 minutes long. Well, just but, but at the same time, cold. I mean, there have been some Bond movies that have, you know, long, I mean, I think... Uh, 26 27 minutes the world is not enough has oh. this huge cold open and then it goes into the to the theme song but uh e- either way it, it's uh, mainly it's just marked by uh usually a cold open is going to be something that doesn't necessarily have to do with specifically you know the main characters of the movie or the main plot of the movie it's just a, a thing now that's gotten better or different over time where you know the cold open of a lot of james bond movies directly impacts the rest of the movie and in this one it's there's no characters that are going to be in the rest of the movie but but it introduces us to the MacGuffin, and so then it gets us into like to focus in on the the key and the the two pieces of the key. So I mean, it didn't bother me that much, and also the title sequence for Mission Impossible movies sucks. It just sucks because it gives you <laughs> a bunch of scenes that we haven't seen yet, and it's it's just like pre-roll uh, YouTube crap where when you watch a YouTube video, they'll take a chunk. If it's a video that's like a 10 minute long video, they'll take like a 10 second chunk that's in the middle of the video and they'll put it at the beginning of the video to keep you watching for the 10 seconds past so they can get their credit for the YouTube view or something. And then and then they don't really care after that. But just as long as they keep you hooked for 10 seconds, that's all that they care about. This feels like, I'm not saying that's what they're doing in this thing. They, they've definitely had a consistency to their their uh title sequences where they do show you little scenes and little snippets from each of the characters that they that they reference or each of the actors that they reference but it's just like we're gonna see that in 20 minutes we're gonna see that in an hour i don't need to see that right now like i'm trying to like stay i really did try to stay away from as much as i could with you know with this movie i mean i watched the trailers and i watched the um i watched the sequences that showed you how he did the jump and all those things but i didn't really want to know that much about like who all was going to be in the movie and and i really didn't know like i didn't know what Haley atwell's character was or any of that stuff so i I'm, i was glad that i got to to go in with somewhat of a clean slate but yeah so i i, I am fine with where the the title sequence was but um it, it didn't bother me that much other than the fact that it was a title sequence. So, yeah. So, um, do, do we want to talk about the, the, the kind of like slower parts, I guess, where they, where they start introducing all these people using typewriters to type a bunch of information, get, getting it from a digital oh. to an analog thing. Like to right. me, the only thing that was, uh, r- remarkable about that to me would be, uh, the fact that they are really focused on like not using like digital typewriters or like digital monitors, which like t- it means nothing. Like you can't hack a digital monitor. You can't hack a digital typewriter. It it's not that they don't have the computing power to really do anything uh, like a computer would. So I just they they kind of took it to the nth degree in this movie as far as like we want everything analog, and it's like I, I that doesn't make sense from a, an engineering standpoint or from an electronic standpoint, but nobody yeah, cares but about that. Yeah, but that kind of, well, that's, well, I mean, you do. So uh, that's somebody. 
And I also think that that's a visual thing. If you don't have, the, if you don't know that, and I guess on some level I did know that, but I might not have been able to say it like you just said it. But that goes without saying <laughs> with us. I mean, pretty much say what I need to say anyway. You do. Anyway, the point is, is that that's a visual thing. If yeah. you see somebody typing on a keyboard into a computer, they're going to automatically think that's connected to everything. They're not going to understand it. And to actually bring it back, like going to a, 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 a phone on the a phone booth on the side of the street, you know, you can't have Superman do that anymore because there are none. Well, not mm -hmm. a lot. And the ones that we do have are not all encompassing like the old ones were. So it, it allows a visual to happen to allow people to understand that this is they're taking drastic steps. But also, I, I'm not sure and I can't really speak on it, but I know that there are things in place already that like aren't most of the nuclear codes and all of the way to initiate the nuclear warheads all on floppy disks still like it's still the original technology that was being used because you can't you can't uh steal that or you can't do anything in through the internet or where however you do it uh through a floppy disk that's my understanding so i think there are things that are already in place that in case this happens, I'm sure they're much more intricate than how I just described that because you do have to have fail safes when it comes to certain things, and, you know, nuclear devastation being pretty main one. Mm -hmm. So to me, it wasn't as far fetched to understand. But if you take somebody who's al always had a cell phone in their hand since the day they were born, they might not be able to visualize what's going on like they don't understand why somebody in 1955 couldn't just call 911 they don't understand that because they don't know 911 didn't exist yeah. so it, it it's a good visualization i didn't necessarily have a, a problem with it i thought it put the people who were trying to keep things safe which you're not sure exactly the people who should be keeping it safe um because you're not sure what their intentions are about when they get it which is something fascinating about this film. Everybody, you know, everybody's looking over their shoulder at everybody else. But it 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 gave them an at stake thing. They have to make sure all of it is non internet related, non computer related, yeah. and that to me is interesting because it turns the film on in on itself again. You've got this modern day film that comes out in 2020, uh, 2023. You've got all these modern day things, these eye things, this face thing, this technology thing, and then. You have to stop it because now the all the things making those are is in jeopardy of threatening those. That I thought was clever. I I yeah. liked that. Well, and and it also it also sets up Luther and Benji, you know, using and doing what they normally do, which is utilizing technology to either uh, obfuscate where Ethan is or help Ethan get to a certain place or you know figure out. Uh, you know, different different uh, paths or, or modes of transportation for Ethan or, you know, prevent people from finding him, all that stuff. It forces them to, to at some point, it gives us a little bit of that at the airport. Like they don't really get shut down by the AI at the airport, but they do get shut down by, by the AI in, in Venice and, and get, you know, all, you know, all that stuff gets messed up by the AI in Venice because of how they're utilizing electronics and because of how they're utilizing communications, satellites and all kinds of things to communicate with each other. So, you know, that it, it, it sets the precedent for that. So I, I thought that was a good wrinkle because those were all the things that, that we were just, we assumed that would be available to them, but all the mission impossible movies do a very good job of like, and, and, and the, the best uh, example of this is, the chronic malfunctioning of the mask making machine. It's yeah. Like, I thought that was great. Yeah. It, it happens in every movie. It happens in every single movie. Something goes wrong with a mask, you know, or something gets delayed with a mask or, you know, you can't use the mask in the way that you were supposed to use it. And, and so that it, it it's, it's a good uh, example of, of that, you know, failing technology when they're reliant on that technology to, to get their jobs done. But somehow they always figure out a way to get it done. So that just goes to show you that the ingenuity of the human is going to always outweigh the capabilities of a machine. So we have hope yet for humanity. Um, but 
You don't sound convinced. <laughs> you, s- <laughs> you sound a little bit more sarcastic and cynical than you do optimistic. I mean, but that kind of bodes what we were talking lane. about <laughs> last week. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I I actually think that there's a way to blend the two but you know oh yeah definitely oh me too yeah that's what i do every day what i do can't be done with only humans and it can't be done with only machines so you know uh i I get it but um so yeah i mean i what how'd you like the abu dhabi airport setup i mean like it seemed like a good way to get us to to get benji and and luther in and to kind of get us introduced to the grace character and it was it was like fairly low stakes too it was a kind of a a lull in the movie before things really ramp up to me are you talking about where the character becomes a ghost character and he keeps disappearing yeah well at the airport yeah and and Mm -hmm. they change his face facial recognition for other yeah i mean i didn't think about the fact that if the ai is erasing the guy in real time why is he not or it is not um, taking care of Ethan Hunt and exposing him at the same time. If he yep. can erase, if I keep saying he, I don't know why. Um, if the computer, the, the entity, AI, the entity, yes, which is you know a little cheesy, but at the same time, apropos. Well, the um, thing was already taken by Jane, <laughs> <laughs> by Carpenter. That thing, um, the entity. I think the entity is a movie too, actually. Oh, great. Um, yeah, with Barbara Hershey, and I don't know why I'm just now thinking of this and know it, but it's this spirit that can like physically take control of her life. Um, it's it's Barbara Hershey. It's called the yeah, Entity. I'm Ron sure. Ron Silver's in it too. Yeah, huh. yeah, I'm sure of it. I was sure of it. Interesting. So I mean, you know, whatever. Anyway, the thing, the Entity, uh, the AI. I never thought about that, and that is actually compliments to the to the film you're not thinking logically step by step you're following what they're telling you to follow and that's a good thing because mm-hmm. and i felt like um it was every good pickpocket scene we've ever seen in a movie just done in 2023 or whenever they they filmed it so yeah i had i didn't necessarily think it was a lull a lull in it i I actually thought it was essential and it allowed you to know that the AI could do what it could do. At the same time, you're still focused on one thing, getting that key, keeping that key, explaining that to her, so forth and so on, and trying to figure out what she's all about and why she's even invested. Her full story has not been told. So yeah, I didn't. Grace, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't. Yes, Grace. I didn't feel like it was a lull. I felt like it was a necessity and I was fine with it. Yeah, and what did you think about the uh, Shea Wiggum character and uh, what's his name? You got to help uh, me because yeah, that, that's the two the two guys who were sent to catch uh, Ethan Hunt from the uh, government. You know the the kind of like uh, Shea Wiggum had oh yeah had a group of guys that were go you know going with him. Yeah, and, I love him. Um, yeah, he's been in a bunch of stuff. Playbook. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, it always seems like even when you know it's going to happen. It always seems like a little bit of an eye rolling situation when they're at the end of the the port as the boat's taking off and they're like, mm-hmm. we're going to get you. It's every time yeah. with them that they just barely miss, miss them. Um, so I don't, I think that's supposed to, and maybe I'm reading too deep into it. That's supposed to be like you and I We're that's supposed to be the everyday guy. That's not, that's supposed to be the realistic person who's trying to hunt down hunt for other purposes other than this mission or to save the world or whatever. They're realistically grounded and supposed to be, but that unfortunately makes them a little ridiculous in places. They don't have the power of the AI. They don't have the ingenuity of this organization. Ethan hunt, Ethan Mm -hmm. uh, hunt works for, so yeah, it was a little bit like I wish they had taken them out some way midway through the film because well, I don't think you need them past a certain point. I know they're kind of the keystone cops of the movie to me. Where once again I say all this, blah, 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 and you say one thing and you get well, it exact. That's exactly right. Yeah, but but at the same time, close to the end, you've got Shea Wiggum and uh, Greg Tarzan Davis, who was also in uh, Top Gun Maverick. 
uh, which Christopher McQuarrie wrote and Tom Cruise starred in. He was Coyote, I think, was the was the he was one of the pilots. But either way, those two guys they, they did have a scene that kind of close to the end where it's like, uh, you know, uh, Shea Wiggum asks Greg Tarzan and Davis like, well, what what would you do if you had the power of this AI? You know, if if somebody gave it to you, you know, if you found it and 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 you know, what would you do? He's like, oh, well, I would hand it off to my superior officer. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, right. Oh, okay, what do you think they would do with it? You know, do you really trust them with it? So I think there's a kind of like a, uh, you know, the old the old guard and the the new up and comer. They're trying to have that kind of dynamic, uh, but between those two and trying to figure out a way to a way to have a little subplot in there too to just to just be like, you know, these are the kind of middle managers or you know middle. Uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground type guys in the the uh, the security NSA CIA type type of a, of a setup. So I mean, there, it's a, a lot going on. In a more articulate way, what you just said isn't that exactly what I just said, but you just said it in a better way. He's oh. they're like that. Yeah, I like the fact that you can just pinpoint exactly your thought and I. I struggle with it sometimes, but you're exactly right. I think you are. They're middle management. They're the Keystone cops. That's yeah. exactly what I was saying. They're like the everyday guy. They're like you and I in that situation if we were cops or if we were yeah. in their position. We're, and I think that's supposed to make it relatable for people like us to be like, oh, an everyday person, if you will, finger quotes, a Keystone cop. A middle manager is still trying to do the right thing and they, of course they pose the moral question and they have the everyday guy pose that to the everyday guy mm-hmm. and so i get that it's just a little bit just a little bit of yeah, okay i you know. know yeah it, it gets tired you, quickly you lost him again shocker yeah. i mean well so uh, shocks <laughs> <laughs> Once we get to uh, Rome, that's that's when for me, I, I think I really enjoyed, I, th- I probably enjoyed the Rome sequences the best out of the whole movie. Uh, the the car chase sequences and even just the Excellent. little banter back and forth between uh, Tom Cruise and Haley Atwell and that's really where her character kind of you know starts to to get a little bit. Do we start to kind of see the the uh, the nefariousness with with her character where she's able to get out of situations, whether it's picking, uh, uh, you know, the lock on her handcuff or whether it's intimating that a guy is, is touching her or taking her somewhere inappropriately to get herself out of situations because she is able to, to, that's, that's one way for her to, was one of the ways for her to escape was when they were coming down out of the, the police station in Rome. And she's like, Oh, I don't know what she said, but she said something to the fact that like she saw a bunch of other guys in the, the open area there. And she's like, Oh my gosh, this guy did something horrible to me, you know? And then she's like, whoop out of there. And Tom Cruise is like, why? Come on. So I, that, that to me, it just shows the, you know, that she's been doing this for a while, but she's not been a spy for a while. She's just been surviving for a while. So that's the, the kind of like uh, cool part about her character. And then she's, she's also essentially a fish out of water in this movie too. And I think Haley Atwell plays both of those very well and is somehow able to play those simultaneously. Um, but once they get in that, like the first, the BMW together, um, and then, uh, well, she gets in a wreck first, right? Cause that was really right. cool. The way that she got into that wreck, how it was, it's the classic, okay, we're going to shoot her from the side and then she's driving and then you don't see a car coming, but then immediately we're in the car with her when she gets hit. Uh, and, and, uh, we also get introduced to, Tom Clementif's uh, Paris character. Um, so, you know, she's from Guardians of the Galaxy and she's been in a couple other things too. But but anyway, at that point... Yes, and that that's yeah. actually interesting. She's the opposite of the Keystone Cops. She is one of those people who just happens to show up at the last minute and happens to be in the right place at the right time to do something for the evil side of the situation. But yet, she's not she doesn't induce the eye rolling as much as the Keystone cops do. Yeah. I don't know why, maybe because she's pulling it off better. And by mm, the way, everything yeah. that you just described about uh, Grace and Ethan in this film, you could describe about Indy and Phoebe, Waller, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge mm. in The Dial of Destiny. Every single description you just described Grace as, you could You're describe right. 
Phoebe Waller Bridge as in Indiana Jones. And you have so the two main characters in a very small car or or conveyance driving down very small streets. And they both pull it off. They're yeah. both interesting chase sequences. And you're like, that's a bit ridiculous, but that's what makes it so interesting. How to make this ridiculous little vehicle work in this situation turns it on its head. It it, it you're you cannot Mission Impossible does a really good job job of it. James Bond films do a really good job of making car chases interesting over and over and over and over and over again. Which is the one with uh is it the last one with Tom Cruise and the motorcycle? Which is the one yeah, where Yeah, Fallout, he's okay. in Paris going around yeah. the Arc de Triomphe. Reinvention, but still kind of the same stuff. And this film uh, this new Dead Reckoning film does a really good job of just going, okay, we know you've seen a car chase a gazillion million times before, but what would happen if, and they put you in a different situation or they put you in a different vehicle, obviously, mm -hmm. in the same kind of situations, how do you react when this is the 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 car and i think they do a really good job of it and i love i love the fact that because usually we're seeing uh chases where uh ethan hunt is is in he's the the only person in the car or he's in the car like in fallout he's in the car with the bad guy from a couple movies before and and it's just, but with this one we become kind of the fish out of water we get to feel like Haley atwell feels because in a lot of the scenes the camera is in the car with the actors and then especially once she gets hit in that car uh it's broadsided you see kind of like we're still in shock and you get the like the tinnitus kind of uh you know buzzing in the ears and then all of a sudden like with no audio on, on you know in the movie at all you just see this motorcycle this like empty motorcycle come flying by the camera on the right side and then tom cruise comes on the left side and and punches a guy who's trying to get into her car uh her wrecked car and just busts busts him up and so tom cruise pretty much like gets rid of like five or six guys in you know five seconds and he breaks her out of the car and that's when they get into a different car but we're just kind of like experiencing this like force of nature that is ethan hunt you know in a in a in a very uh contained way and then we're, we're in it with with grace and i thought that was that was really cool but once they get into that uh that bmw and start driving through the streets they do a very smart thing where they they break all the doors off mm. so it's it's forcing us as audience members to realize that tom cruise is driving this car and i assumed that there were certain scenes that he drove and then there were other scenes that he didn't drive but it looks like he drove on all of those scenes, like in both of the cars, like, and, and he's doing, and, and then of course the, the piece de resistance, even though that's French and we're in Italy is that they're handcuffed to each other. So mm -hmm. he's having to drive one handed while he's handcuffed to Haley Atwell. And so I thought that was, that was another wrinkle to me that it was just like, there's no, it doesn't, they don't need to do that, but there's a reason in the story why they need to do that because he doesn't want her to get away. And it, it also just in increases the the danger of, of the whole thing, especially since you've got a guy who's not a stunt, a stunt man, but uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, Tom Cruise is a stunt man, um, you know, who's driving through these cobblestone streets and has, you know, only one hand to be able to maneuver. And it's just, it's, it's extreme. Uh, but I was, I was impressed with all of the driving, whether it was in the BMW or in the small Fiat or whatever, but, um, and then they do figure out a way to get comedy out of that, that Fiat. They have to switch. Yes. They they have to, to, or they no, end where, up switching. Wait, wait. They yeah. end up switching. And when they, they don't they know where their hands are supposed to go. The and steps, yeah, yeah, it's clever. It, well, because it's what your mind thinks of mm -hmm. when you see a film like that. You spoke about the the uh, bad guy being in the car with him in the other film. And you always see that in films and the person's driving and they're like, psh, 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 psh. you <laughs> yeah. see that in the Matrix uh, trilogy um, in Reloaded, which is yet another reference to that, by the way. Um and you're like, okay, yeah, very cool. Trinity can do that and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't make any sense how you're shooting. I mean, it doesn't logically make sense. So when you handcuff two people to a car and you have to drive, your brain, whether or not it's subconsciously or consciously, goes, wait, no, 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 no. What would happen if, wait, that wouldn't happen. That That's not logical. They're, oh, they're they're excusing that to make sure they could do this and this they don't they mm -hmm. utilize it and they go wait no you know you drive what no and it's 
really well done. It's a smart chase sequence. It mm-hmm. really is. I can't wait to see that again, as a matter oh, of fact. It's great. And you, you see so much more. One of the things that, I re- that really hit me the second time was that when they're driving and the camera is in the back seat, essentially behind Tom Cruise and Haley Atwell. And as he's cornering so hard, you see her hair because her hair is down. You see her hair moving in ways that would only happen if she was in the car and the car was swaying back and forth. Like it's not, you can tell it's not a green screen. You can tell that it's, it's all like she's in there feeling those G forces, you know, in the same way that, that you would be if you were in the car. It's just, you can't fake that. Like there's no way to fake that. Well, just a side note, but we were talking about insurance and all this other stuff. They couldn't get a stunt man to do it. How do they get um, somebody like Grace's character to be insured? How do they how do they get another actor? Yeah, Tom Cruise says, "Okay, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing yeah. to do that. I'm willing to sacrifice this. I'm willing to say, "Hey, I can get insured for this. I can get insured for that. Mm. I can insure the company for this." Do they have to insure? I don't um, know if that well, you, well separately. I think she did look back. I'm trying to remember if she looked back during some of those scenes uh where it was you know, back and oh, forth. Oh, so it's they probably could, a stunt. It could have been a stunt. A stunt person. But the hair is real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Okay. Real, I say. Yeah. So it's may, it might not be her, the actress, but yeah. it might be. Okay. I know okay. certain scenes she did look back fix. into the camera. Um, but, and there, and there were probably other scenes where, you know, they're like, you know what, we don't need her here today because she's not going to be seen on camera or whatever. But, but they definitely, it wasn't to the point where I was like, oh, that's obviously a stunt woman. Or, oh, man, right. there's no way that she would have been in this. Because she very well could have been. I mean, I just, I was, you know, going through, like, YouTube and stuff and just talking about, uh, you know, the, Re- Rebecca Ferguson was talking about her first day on uh, yeah, I saw her that Mission too. Impossible. And she's, like, yeah. sliding down, uh, you know, yeah. outside an opera house. And it's like, yeah. okay, well, this you're in here with me. We're, you know, we're in this together. And they didn't have a stunt woman, you know, do that with Tom Cruise. So, I mean, my guess is that they had Haley Atwell in there, in the car with him. I'm sure she had some sort of five-point harness stuff, whatever, you know. And, and the car was probably reinforced in a lot of different ways or all of those things. They really do go to the nth degree to, to make it as safe as possible. But um, but ultimately, it's it's still a stunt. The stuff that I was really wondering about the, of, on the second time watching was in the train sequence, you know, her kind of climbing around. It looks like her climbing around, and she probably was. And I'm sure they just painted out all the, you know, straps and things that, that they had her connected to. Um, but but it's like I said, same thing. You can't fake that as when it comes to like hair blowing in the wind and all that stuff, like that's really hard to do and make look realistic. So it's just, it's worth doing it real and, and making it, making it happen. So, um, yeah, that's, and all of the, all the train stuff, like they were doing that. They, I'm sure they were strapped in, but you know, similar to inception and and those other movies where you're kind of like in a, in a room that's rotating, it's, that's, it's par for the course if you're going to do a Mission Impossible movie. So well, it ready. makes sense. They you hear actors talking about all the time about rehearsal, rehearsal, and then they actually get to the set that's actually Rome, and they're like, oh, this colors it completely different. It feels completely different. And you also hear actors talking about built sets, and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to have to suspend my disbelief, and then you walk on it, and you're like. I'm in Los Angeles, but I'm in New York, and there's no doubt I'm in New York. Hmm. That to me adds to the scene. And as for that train sequence, I it just keeps going and going. I mean, how many we just saw one in Indiana Jones? How many ride the roof of a train sequence must we have in films? But that one is that tunnel is mm-hmm. forever. Yeah. And then there's stuff in the middle where they fall down the side yes. of the tunnel. Horrifying. And then you're thinking, okay, that, okay, my heart can come back down to normal rate. And then all of a sudden, and it yeah. keeps going. And like I said, I made reference to Poseidon Adventure. That movie affected me, the original one, when I was a child so deeply, the idea of everything upside down. And there's a scene in that film where the, uh, the little boy character has to go to the bathroom and he finds the bathroom. And of course, the urinal is up there because the boat is upside down. And mm-hmm. he's like, uh, and for whatever reason, that psychologically did something to me. Like the thought of being things that are supposed to be 
one way or another way. And so this is to the nth degree in this film. It keeps going and you think they're climbing out and it keeps going and they, it's nonstop. And the idea of actually having your own body weight the reason why you might fall to your death is frightening to me. Mm. And it keeps going and going and they get secured and then it falls again. And it yeah. d- it's heart poundingly well done. Yeah. It, Very and well it, done. And and it does give you, they give you enough of like, a, it, it, it's kind of like a, a intervals, you know, they, they give you an interval of, of extreme yeah. Just stress, and then they're like, "Oh, look, we we made it!" And they're like, "Nope, here right. comes the next one." So right. you get like two seconds to just be like, "Okay, whoa, uh, that was close," and then, "Nope, we're gonna die again." So the, yeah, and that in my mind times. though, when I'm watching it, it's like, "Don't settle, don't, no, 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 this is not over." <laughs> like in my mind, I'm watching it, going, "I know this is not over. Yeah. I know that they're trying to not recreate something because we've seen this a million gazillion times." Sure, but they're trying to not top it that everything everybody's done throughout movie history, they're trying to top themselves inside the scene. Mm -hmm. So that one little settle, she gets kind of secure at one point. And I'm like, no, no, (laughs) you better hold, don't let go. And you see her kind of start to like, be like, oh, and she starts to let go. And I'm like, what are you doing? Have you never seen a Mission Impossible film before? (laughs) Don't let go. And then boom. And then he has to save her technically again. And, you're like, I knew for you to not let go. And it's interesting how it never talks down to the audience. It allows the audience to be exactly where you need to be when you're watching the film. And that is something that sometimes action films will do. They, they, It's not necessarily talking down to the audience, but they assume that, oh, yeah, we know that's a little bit fake, but you're going to accept it. Mm, no, we're not. We're going to accept what you give us. And in that sequence, that train sequence, forget it. Yeah. It's I mean, consistently horrific the whole entire time. It's it's what makes a movie series like this different than the Fast and Furious series, which I'm fine with. I I, I watched them. I haven't watched the last couple, but um, but they they just they just assume you're like, hey, well, you know this is fake. We know this is fake. We're not going to really yeah. try too yeah. much harder to make you think it's real. So yeah. you know, let's let's all go for this uh, for this ride together. But. But in this movie, they they I feel like do I do feel like they're trying to say like no we want to we want to make it seem like when you look down on this you know hollow shell of a of a train car and you see rocks with you know a bunch of fire and stuff at the bottom that you're you're gonna believe that that could be real so I mean and and that's that feels better than oh isn't it cool that this car just like impossibly flew and got caught in midair with a, Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen the last one. Yeah. I haven't seen. Okay. Well, but, but I'm not against it. I just, it's just not my thing. And so it doesn't call to me. I mean, on a Saturday, rainy day, maybe. Um, well, it's interesting because you said we're going to seem to make it like this. They do make it like that in that sequence. It, you are frightened. It's not like we're going to try to make it as realistic. So you will believe it. I believed it. Mm. It was realistic. It worked completely. It's heart pounding. Just thinking about it. Mm. And in a way, I don't like that (laughs) in a way. I don't, I don't like it. I mean, I, I guess it's like riding a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Like there's a thrill to it. Um, but I've ridden enough roller coasters in my life that if I don't ever get to ride a roller coaster again, I'll be okay with it. But mission impossible films seem to be able to up the ante just enough to yeah. where you're like, Oh no, you got me again. Stop. Slow down. Yeah. At least get her out or at least get him out. Yeah. Somebody needs to get out and safe <laughs> before yeah. we're always doing it again and again. It's well done. It's yeah. extremely well done. Well, we just kind of glossed over or didn't even mention the, one of the potentially greatest on screen stunts of all time, which was the motorcycle base jump. Uh, and, and the, so I, I watched the, the little special thing and I'm assuming you watched the little special, like whatever it was six months ago. So, but I didn't, what I didn't realize, I mean, so I kind of knew what to expect on that. I didn't know where it fit within the movie, but still, I just kind of knew what it was. But what I didn't expect is all the other angles that they got of him. Uh, as he was base jumping, like some of the close ups and just him delivering lines while in midair like comedic lines while in midair and then having to pull his shoot and, and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, that was the the stuff that I did not expect. And I was like, that is, 
you know, the respect for that, that it wasn't just like, look at this grandeur and see that we have multiple angles of a single jump. Like, I mean, the guy did it like seven, eight times, you know, uh, and, and it's, he's fearless obviously, but, um, but that I, I really did have a lot of respect for that, that it wasn't completely t- number one tied to, um, uh, him the whole way, because in fallout we get to see, it's not an unbroken take, but it, you know, all the way to the ground, but it is a, uh, a long, you know, a long scene where he, where we're with him the whole time in midair. And in this movie, they kind of said like, well, we did a skydiving thing even in just the last one. So we're going to do something different. And then by, they, they made it much more interesting and a, and a lot funnier by removing the scenes of him actually, you know, getting, getting, uh, close to the train, because by the time we do see him crash into the train, we've you kind of forgot about it. Like you didn't forget about him, but then you're like, man, I can't wait to get back to the part where we get to see him land on the train and see where he's going to come back into the story. But he just crashes right in. So I don't, I thought that was masterful. So yeah. What do you think? Once again, I don't think they're trying to top themselves. I think they're trying to make what they've chosen to do in this film the best action sequence they can. Because how do you top yourself? You've been on the side of a plane. You've been on the side of a building with suction cups, which is horrifying. <laughs> um, I, ugh, I don't know. I would. Mm, I don't know. I would have to. I would have to negotiate hard for that if I was having to do that. But, and it is. You're thinking him going off the side of base jumping off of the side of a mountain with a motorcycle is not that big of a deal for Ethan Hunt at this point in time. It's not that big of a deal. So when there are the hum- when there is the humor in the middle of it and you know that there is this has taken a couple times for them to get this shot, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, you admire it in a different way. And you know that he's going to miss the train. You know that he, the train is going to do something it's not supposed to do. You know on some level. So the stunt itself doesn't seem to be as grand as the other stuff that he's done in this uh, these movies before. But the fact that the stakes become higher and different in the middle of the stunt is what makes it interesting to me. Like you're thinking he should have gotten on the train here and that would have been difficult enough. Mm-hmm. But it's not. He has to... And then he has to figure it out and then he has to say, okay, this might work. This might not work. It probably won't work, but I've got to take my chance anyway. That heightens the stunt even more. That makes it even more spectacular. We're used to Tom Cruise on some level doing these crazy things, even though this is crazy and I would never do it. Um, Never do it. (laughs) Uh, But because the way they wrote that sequence it becomes that much more interesting what he chooses to do. So in a way, me saying I would never do it is like a high holy compliment because it's so crazy over the top and so crazy dangerous in my mind that that heightens it for me, for the character, for the scene, for the series, and for Tom Cruise. And that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we didn't talk about Elsa dying, but I mean, what did? But to me, that was. I you. Oh, I guess you said she she might come back, right? Is that what you're saying? Is that where you're gonna plant your flag? Well, doesn't she? Because after she dies. Yeah. Don't you see her later? Oh no 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 no. That's no. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. I, it seemed a little like, cause they're very like, uh, close. I mean, they're like cuddling in Venice. And so I, and you can tell that like they, there's, there's a, a thing between them, a romantic thing between them. Right. Um, but is there supposed to be a romantic thing between him and grace or are they supposed to set up a romantic thing between him and grace? Because I hope they don't. Yeah, me too. Because it, especially too old for her. Yeah, especially. uh, Yeah, especially if they uh, are trying to do some sort of spinoff thing with her. So, um, yeah, not convinced that that's where that's going though. Okay, well, I'm not convinced that. That's my little, uh, you know, theory that I'm. I mean, you've been right about things like that before, but 
Yeah, I just oh, like seeing Haley Atwell she's, kick butt. <laughs> she's forty one years old. Haley Atwell is. Well, yeah. he's sixty one oh, sh- years old. Yeah, it's gross. But she looks great. She she's forty one. Is a smoke show. Wait, is that? <laughs> she is a smoke show. Yeah, nineteen eighty two, forty one. She's wow. She looks fan. Fantastic. Still gross. Still unnecessary. She should be, if anything, his protege. She should be, if anything, a fictitious replacement for a possible world we'll ne- we're never going to see. I don't so think then that- why get rid of Ilsa? Why get well, rid of? Doesn't Mexico? most of his romantic partners die anyway? They do. And isn't isn't Grace kind of sort of like what's her name? Um, uh, the other. Oh God, I had it pulled up and I forgot. So the Michelle name's Monahan? Come, so, yes. No. Michelle Monaghan, he married. I know, but Haley Atley, Atwell is just, it's the same looking person, yeah. same type, same yeah. type. But look what happened to her. Michelle, Ma- what's her last Monaghan. name? Monaghan. Monaghan. Look what happened to her. I mean, he married her and look. So I, I don't know. She's still I, alive. I mean, I something. think when they kill a main character or somebody you've gotten used to in one of these uh, series, it's because they don't want to kill Tom Cruise. They don't yeah. want to kill Ethan Hunt. They don't want to kill Indiana Jones. They want to leave Indiana Jones in the past. They don't want to do these drastic things that would actually, I think, make it a little bit better if they killed these characters and be done with them. Done. Okay. And then if you want to prequel it, if you want to uh, what happens in the name of Ethan Hunt, I am revenging Ethan Hunt. And it becomes this whatever you entitled it before IMF part one, you yeah. know, whatever it is, then I'm fine with it. But if he's going to show up, if he's going to be the John Voight character in the first film, if he's going to be the secret advisor, if he's going to be the one who twists the plot. And I'm like, either he is or he isn't. And I'm definitive about that. But I just think if you're going to end it, end it. If you're going to end something, end it. Then why not have him die and save the world? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Although I'm glad they didn't kill Batman at the end of the Dark Knight or uh, uh, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. I'm glad you see that sequence, but that's well written. And Mm -hmm. that's what you're... I thought he was dead. And every yeah. time I see that film, I do think on some level he is dying. He's going to die. But then you see that. In the cafe. Not, yeah. yeah. and But that only resonates because of what Alfred's, Alfred says earlier in the film. So that works because of what he said. Now, with him being with Selena Kyle and all that other stuff, I mean, yeah, we're glad that they all survived. And Batman really can never die, it seems like. There's always some way he secretly is taking care of something by initiating Nightwing to becoming the new Batman, whatever you want to say. So I think this is different. I think there is a time limit for Ethan Hunt's story and it, we either end it or we don't. Mm. And if they don't, that's fine. Then they're going to have to figure out a way to keep him going in his sixties, whatever, which there comes a point in time. He's not going to want to do that. Either he's going to do it or he's not going to do it. Either he's going to we'll make make a Mission Impossible movie and be Ethan Hunt, or they're going to have to have some sort of like break and not involve the Ethan Hunt character because he he is Ethan Hunt. Like there is there can never be another Ethan Hunt. That's just impossible. The similarities between this podcast and the last podcast are intense. Yeah, you could lay you could lay it on top of each other, and we could we could intersperse Indiana Jones and Ethan Hunt and almost blurs the lines between what we're talking about because you're right you said that about Harrison Ford too yeah. and, and and but you're right though you're absolutely right i just think that it's respectful to end something in a smart way narrative wise end it and be done with it because the audience will fulfill their own image of what's happening anyway so if you just like let them ride off into the sunset or let them blah 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 unless that's established with the character like i was saying with batman that's Mm -hmm. happened a million times before um then we need a definitive ending because then the audience their imagination goes oh well no because he's dead or no because Mm -hmm. he's paralyzed or god forbid whatever they choose to do but it needs to have a definitive ending 
because that will show respect for the rest of the series. That will yeah. show the audience that, yes, we have respect for this character and this is how it should end. However they choose to revamp it later on is a whole nother story. But yeah. it, if they're going to end it, end it. He cannot ride off into the sunset and live secretly, quietly, unless something with this new AI technology erases everything, which is Dark Knight, Rise, Dark Knight Rises again, mm-hmm. the technology to erase everybody's back history uh, in this computer age. It seems silly. Just, I don't know. I, I guess I'm saying the only way to end it is for him to die, but that's a little cynical and a little jaded, but I would feel fulfilled if yeah. that happened. Done. Yeah. No. I mean, I think me too. Yeah. I mean, it'd be a good way to, and that doesn't mean that doesn't preclude other Mission Impossible adjacent movies from ever being made, but there should not be any more Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies after this part two. So he's going to die, and then you're going to see somebody ripping off their face, and it's going to be Tom Cruise walking away. Oh. Oh, no. He's gonna be. He's gonna meet up with Hannibal Lecter, and you know, and all the mysterious walking away scenes you've seen of characters yep. that have gotten away with it. So, Jeez. and then uh, he's gonna have a limp, and then he's his limp's gonna straighten out, and then he'll get in well, a car. Did what's his name win the Oscar for that? Yes. Didn't what's his name the writer and director of this? Did uh, he win the? He he did. He, yeah. Yeah. He won the uh, original screenplay, right? For that movie, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. You go to facebook.com slash actorandengineer. You can X us at... <laughs> I've been waiting all week to say that. Please don't. Please X me. Don't, get me, don't get me started. This is too... It's already an hour and 17 minutes of Mission Impossible. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> Go to Facebook.com. I already did that. Uh, YouTube, just search for the actor in the engineer podcast. We'll see you next time. Bye.